I too would like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional custodians of, of the lands on which we variously meet tonight and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, and I too would like to pay um, particular respect to um, millennia of engineering practice and knowledge uh, in this country. Um, and it is an important thing for us to be acknowledging right now and in this place and as part of our journey. Um, I'm not going to speak for very long. Um, my job is to uh, say a few words and then retire gracefully to the audience and, and, and leave, leave this uh, work to the panel to be done. But what I wanted to do was um, frame the conversation that we're having tonight. Uh, and I think it's um, uh, worthwhile at this point to go back to the beginnings of engineering at the ANU. And they uh, go back to somebody called uh, Professor Ian Ross, who fittingly was uh, a chemist uh, and in this particular, we sit in this particular building. It is a, uh, a building that contains uh, Mathematical Sciences Institute and the School of Computing, um, but it resides on the physical footprint of what used to be uh, chemistry at the ANU. So Ian Ross has a connection to this particular place. We have also honoured his contributions to this university through the Ian Ross Building, which is uh, one of the first buildings that was built um, and dedicated specifically towards engineering at the ANU. Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, Ian is famous for saying, and I would like to thank Mick Cardew Hall for continuing to keep this particular quote alive, which is that Ian used to say that um, uh, engineering at the ANU should be able to produce a woman who was able to design the Black Mountain Tower as well as to talk about and engage with the conversation about whether or not it should be built at all. Now, he was saying that in the 70s. So following that, there was a very significant Australia-wide review of uh, what engineering might turn into over the future that occurred in the 80s. And off the back of that review, um, there are a number of people in this room who engaged with the very first iteration of engineering education at the ANU in, in the early 90s. Now, the genesis of what um, uh, Ian Ross was talking about, the genesis of that particular review that called out specifically the idea that we needed to get much more explicit around uh, the social or societal aspects of the world in which we are operating as well as engineering. Uh, that genesis is still alive today. So many of the people in this room have heard me talk about the reimagined investment, which uh, has been around uh, now for a couple of years. And it is um, uh, a, a, an articulation of um, the most significant strategic investment that this university has made since foundation to help this university achieve its aspiration to be the most uh, progressive and influential voice for engineering, computing and their use in the world. Now, unfortunately, I'm a product of the Australian education system in the 1980s and so commas are not a good part of my skill set. Um, the point here is, the key phrase here is uh, the use of engineering co uh, computing, uh, progressive voice for engineering, computing and their use of, the use of technology in the world. So this is not necessarily an aspiration about being the best in the world, it's about talking about their use in the world. Um, and the question and the challenge that I always throw out to people is to ask the question, what are the engineering and computing skills that we need at, to, to engage with the conversation around the use of technology in the world in 2050? What are those skills? Who will be exercising them and how? And so that's the, that's the framing for a lot of the discourse that we've had over the last couple of years. And um, we don't have the answers to that. We're working on that right now. And for us, this is part of our continued evolution. Uh, during uh, the last year, we've had to focus very closely on um, how we believe that we might start to tackle the answers to those questions over the next couple of years. And one of the things that we have really focused on is aligning our um, ability to uh, educate and our ability to have impact in the world and our ability to uh, advance the frontiers of thinking and uh, practice all in one particular, uh, all together and in lockstep with each other. So um, on that note, I'm going to um, hand over to Chris and uh, leave it to him to talk specifically about engineering. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, I am sorry that I'm not able to join you in person this evening, um, though joining you uh, by the wonders of Zoom uh, perhaps is, is nearly as good, um, or perhaps not. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which this event is being held, the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples, 
I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I currently stand, which are the Awabakal people, uh, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, so, of course, as you've already heard, um, tonight we're celebrating 30 years of engineering at the ANU by looking forward to the next 30 years. Uh, and I just wanted to take a little bit of time to discuss, in some sense, the fundamental element of our core ongoing mission, which is educating the engineers and technologists and perhaps even, even the humanities and social scientists uh, of the future. Uh, and in particular, I wanted to briefly touch on some of the uh, education focused initiatives that are currently underway in the college. So you can start with the things that haven't changed. Of course, we're continuing to deliver on our historical strengths in electrical engineering, renewable energy engineering, mechatronics engineering. Um, in addition to that, um, understanding the critical need to address the impacts of climate change. Um, nowhere was that, that more clear um, than uh, in the summer of 2019, 2020, uh, with the bushfires uh, up and down the coast. Last year, we developed a new environmental systems major, uh, which is available to students commencing their studies this year. Uh, our distinguished panel chair, Lachlan Blackhall, drove the development of that. I'm sure he can uh, talk about that more if you're interested. Uh, in addition, of course, there's a lot going on at the moment in the country around aerospace engineering. Uh, the country finally has a space agency. Um, as you can tell from my accent, being American, I might be tempted to say that's 30 or 40 years late, um, but we've gotten there eventually. Um, and in part with that and other things going on, uh, this year we'll be developing a new aerospace systems major, uh, which is driven by a, a really amazing trio of professors in the school. Uh, so in particular, um, Professor Katja Bazaka, who holds an ARC Future Fellowship uh, looking at plasma-based propulsion systems. In January, we were joined by Professor Antonia Terzi, whose last port of call was as the lead aerodynamicist for Bentley Motors. Uh, she's also been the aerodynamicist, or one of the aerodynamicists who's worked with the Ferrari and Williams Formula One teams. So she comes to us with a really uh, interesting and exciting set of uh, experiences. And we're also very excited to be welcoming Professor Junichiro Kawaguchi to the ANU. Um, professor Kawaguchi is currently an honorary professor, uh, but will formally join the faculty early next year. Um, I'm sure most of you know who Professor Kawaguchi is, uh, but if you don't, he was the project manager for the Japanese Hayabusa asteroid sample return mission. Um, and of course, the fact that everybody likes to cite about uh, Professor Kawaguchi is that he has his own Lego figurine. Um, something that uh, I'm sure that most of us as engineers would aspire to have. Um, finally, one thing I really wanted to um, highlight, something that I'm, I'm very excited about this year, uh, in collaboration with Indigenous leaders at the ANU, uh, this year we'll see us design and launch the Indigenous Engineering Design Studio. Uh, so this is an initiative that will allow us to make concrete steps towards better access to our college for First Nations peoples uh, and allow us to push forward on our responsibilities towards reconciliation and closing the gap. Uh, it will provide a place for us in collaboration with First Nations peoples to investigate engineering relevant indigenous topics and ways of knowing and then to embed and weave those um, topics throughout our curriculum in ways that have real impact for First Nations peoples. Um, so watch that space. Of course, all of these developments continue to rest on our unique focus on systems engineering. So that's always been a unique element of the ANU's um, educational offering, our systems of systems uh, approach. That includes in our traditional degree bearing programs at the undergraduate and master's levels, um, but also as we start to experiment with new models, uh, such as the various graduate certificates we've stood up over the last two years. Um, and additionally, as we look to engage with industry partners to provide educational offerings and experiences relevant to their needs. 
Now I've focused there in that in that pricey of of where this in some sense where the School of Engineering is going, or at least nominally activities that are held within the School of Engineering. Uh, but in fact, these ac activities, these initiatives are coordinated with activities in the other two schools uh, that form our college. Uh, and those other two schools also have important initiatives underway, uh, both to which we will contribute and from which we can learn. Uh, so by way of example, uh, the School of Computing hosts the Software Innovation Institute, uh, which is a strong translational research engine and incubator for new approaches to software engineering education. School of Cybernetics, uh, headed by uh, distinguished Professor Bell, hosts the 3A Institute, uh, which is driving new models of education in the form of cohort-based master's and PhD programs and highly focused industry partnered short courses. Um, it is uh, ANU Engineering at the ANU, our college, is really an exciting and vibrant place to be at the moment. And I firmly believe that we're well placed uh, to place our distinctive mark on what engineering will look like in 2050. Uh, of course, all of you here have in one way or another been part of that journey for the past 30 years. Uh, and I would hope and ask and invite you to continue to journey with us uh, in the next 30. So thank you again for joining us this evening. And with that, I'll hand back to Lachlan. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Eleanor. Um, <laughs> you may be excused. <laughs> Exit stage left. Um, we're now going to turn our attention um, to the panel discussion, really focusing on um, what will engineering be like uh, in 2050. And I'm really delighted to be joined by our panellists here um, and in this hybrid format by our panellists um, on the screen as well. So I'll first, um, to give you a brief introduction, I'm going to stick to titles only because if I was to read the bios, we'd still be here at 7 o'clock. Uh, so on the screen, we have uh, Michaela Jade, um, who's the founder and CEO uh, of Indigital. Um, which is actually a local ACT company, although ironically, Michaela is joining us from Bruni Island down in Tasmania tonight. And in Digital's um, continuing a proud tradition um, of Indigenous innovation and entrepreneurship uh, in the STEM fields. Our panellists here um, with us tonight are distinguished professor Genevieve Bell, who's the founding director of the School of Cybernetics, um, which Chris mentioned, uh, and also of the 3AI Institute. Uh, Adrian Piani, uh, is chief engineer um, of the ACT, uh, and it's not every every night you get two chief engineers. We're also joined by Jane McMaster, um, who's the chief engineer of Engineers Australia. Ooh. So, before we dive into a Q and A session, um, and which I'd welcome your um, your questions as well, I've asked each of the panelists to make some brief remarks, one to two minutes, about their views and perspectives uh, on engineering uh, in 2050. And Genevieve, I might start with you. Two minutes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, no, it's always good, always good to check what Lachlan wants. Look, I'll let you keep, keep time for me. All right, so, because it would be helpful. So 2050 is an interesting proposition, right? So we have to put ourselves forward 30 years or 29 for those of us that have some acquaintanceship with how numbers work, Eleanor. Uh, so 2050, 30 years from now, effectively a generation. Uh, for me, I think in imagining what engineering should look like in 2050, it's much more tempting to talk not about the skills that are necessary, but the value set and the mindset we'll need to embody. And for me, in thinking about that, I want to go back to engineering formal roots and think about what we can learn from that. So 10 generations ago from 2050, so going back 250 years basically, gets you back to the first degrees that were ever offered in engineering on the planet in Paris at the Ecole Polytechnique. That degree progress came into effect because of a radical and violent rearrangement of a nation. So think Paris, think the late 1790s. We know we have seen the end of the monarchy, the dissolution in violent ways of the aristocracy and the need to establish a new government for the men and indeed some women who were sitting there at that moment in time realizing what it would take to build a nation meant not thinking about birthright and blood and power, it meant thinking about science and art and literature and culture. And it meant assembling a collection of people and educating them with the premise that through their labor they would build a nation. They would build roads, they would build bridges, they would build systems, they would build a flourishing democracy. And when I think about what engineering will need to be in 2050, going back to the late 1700s and imagining that what engineering was about was radical, it was political, it was engaged, 
and it had a profound sense that it needed to build something that didn't exist yet, and it had a responsibility to do that in the service of a country that was coming into being. And while it is tempting to think that engineering is just about the practice and the skills and the work we all have to do, I also think there's something about remembering to occupy the space that says if you engineer a world, you are actually making a political statement, a disruptive statement, and a complicated statement. Just like that. <laughs> Adrian, I'll hand over to you next. You're, uh, welcome, to you're welcome to have a timer as well. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Prefer not. Uh, firstly, I introduce myself, Adrian Piani. I grew up in Canberra, born here. Uh, we are sitting with someone who did graduate from the first cohort of engineers in 1990. It wasn't myself, but my good friend Adam Hassan here. I got halfway through and then um, decided to move. So I did. I was part of the 1990 cohort, which was great memories. Uh, so now I'm the ACT chief engineer. Uh, I did environmental engineering, so I normally have a fairly strong environmental bent. Um, unfortunately, I think our environment is still degrading, even though we're doing great work. I think in 2050 it will probably be worse than it is now. And I think at some stage uh, we'll have to take a more proactive approach, uh, a stronger approach to our environment. So part of that will be just doing what we're doing, trying to minimise our damage, but we might need to re-engineer some of our environmental systems. So this may or may not be heresy, but um, I suspect we'll probably be in the stage where we are actually taking an act active view of what the environment needs to look like to support life and re-engineering it. And we're already doing it, actually, um, but we might have to do it in a more um, programmatic level, if you like, so probably a little bit um, um, scary, but I think we'll have to if it keeps getting worse. Uh, of course, the digital challenge, I think, is a great one for us. I expect digital to help us. Uh, and just um, simple examples for engineering, I think, uh, there's many aspects of engineering that we kind of fall back on rules of thumb. We, we sort of don't have the computational analysis to know why it works, but we know it works, and we do it through a rule of thumb, and I expect all those will be challenged because we'll have the data and the computational strength to, to re revisit those rules of thumb, and I think that'll apply in many areas of engineering. Um, and one example is, yeah, we're designing a pipe network. Actually, we don't know demand. We kind of guess demand based on some simple parameters and it tends to work, but we make the pipe really big um, to get us through peak times. And I hope that our computational and, and, and access to data will enable us to optimise infrastructure better. Hold on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be honest, this is much more regimented than day to day <laughs> life again. Fairly regimented. Everyone's in neat rows here, we've got timers. <laughs> Am I next? Yeah, you yeah. are, Jane. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we could talk about what the future of engineering looks like and in the time frame 2050, you know, almost indefinitely. So I thought I'd narrow it down to one challenge and one aspiration. The challenge, I think, is going to be that, um, you know, that the, some people say the pace of change is never going to be as slow as it is today. So, and I think complexi complexity, too, arguably, is increasing. Um, and I should have said... Um, perhaps to start with my background is aerospace and complex systems. Um, so I do think that the world is getting more complex and technology is getting more complex. So the challenge I think for engineering in the future is that we're probably going to have to specialise a little bit more, I'd be interested to hear what others think. And as we specialise in more complex areas, that's going to challenge our knowledge systems. And I know Michaela has some more to say about how our conventional and traditional knowledge systems are going to be challenged. With that specialisation and increase in complexity, I think that there's going to be even more of a challenge that we're beginning to see today in some areas such as power systems engineering and cyber security and that there's, there's a gap between the people who have the technical knowledge and the policy makers and decision makers. I've worked in cyber security where the language that the technical people talk, just there's a chasm between the language that the technical people talk and the policy people talk and it's a problem and I, I have seen it too in power systems engineering so I, I think the challenge is that there'll be more of those areas and so that's something that we need to be cognizant of. The aspiration and both Eleanor and um, Lachlan have commented on this is that as our challenges become more complex they're going to become more interdisciplinary um, techno socio-economic uh, challenges and we're going to have to collaborate more. I think engineers are going to have to step up a little bit more as well. Um, as Genevieve highlighted, um, we've always had a responsibility and I think we've always lived up to that to a point, but I think it's time that we need to step up a bit. 
I spent the first 15 years of my career working in defence and aerospace, surrounded by engineers. Can I have one more sentence? <laughs> and I, had, I, had, I really had little appreciation of the engineering skill set and mindset until 15 years into my career when I went to work for a government agency in a building of 500 people and only two of us were engineers. And I suddenly was just astounded by how engineers think and our contribution. So I guess to wrap up, I think we need to step up. We need to recognise what con contribution we can make more broadly than just technology, but the context and how it's used and, uh, and be willing to contribute in that way as well. Thank you. Uh, Michaela, we'll, we'll throw to you and we'll save you um, having to have the timer here, which I've now secured back in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still same on Lunawani. Um, what I mean, I'm a proud Cabrigal woman uh, from the Georges River in Sydney and Bujuri Gumada come with good spirit to you from Lunawani, which is otherwise known as Bruni Island. Um, I think it's really important when we're designing systems that we all sit in the discomfort of our disconnection with things that we acknowledge um, through events and on a day-to-day -day basis. And thinking about our grandmothers and grandfathers, our mothers and fathers, our homes, our ancestors, the communities that we belong to, the nations that we serve and our ceremony and how we hold ourselves and our language and traditions and how we live with reciprocity with our natural world because these all influence the past, present and future of systems that we build. And I think by 2050, I would predict that we're looking more towards nature um, as it disappears um, because we will have realized that it's the most efficient energy system on the world in the world and the best recycler and the best engineer. Um, so the skills in reading country and really reading country are going to be very important um, as we kind of find our way together between the natural world, the ancient world and the world that we want to build. And I think that also working with the world's oldest knowledge systems and the world's new newest knowledge systems and co-designing solutions together will be really important. But I do have a caveat around that in that we need to be working together now, otherwise we won't have the opportunity to do that in 2050. Sure, Great. sharp, efficient. Thanks very much, Michaela. <clears throat> so I think, you know, we, we'd now like to sort of just start some uh, start the conversation and I have the prerogative here as chair I think to throw out the first couple of questions I think you know we've talked a lot um, about you know the challenges that we're going to face um, I think the strong focus on you know the challenges around the environment and climate and so on as we start to think about how we're going to educate the next generation of engineers um, in this you know in this context with these kind of existential challenges you know what are the things that we're going to have to keep um, front of mind uh, to ensure that we can embrace all of these changes that are coming and arrive at 2050 in a better place. Genevieve? <laughs> oh, okay. Re-engineer engineering. Start the timer. Go. Uh, so, I mean, I sit in a, I, I sit with a different kind of discomfort here, Mick, as I'm sure you'd know. Uh, my training is not in engineering. I'm an anthropologist by training and a technologist by 20 years of time in Silicon Valley and an engineer sometimes by the people I hang around with. Uh, I think it is safe for me to echo Janet's notion that engineers would need to step up, but I think there's also a bit about step into that discomfort too, because I think part of what an education will need to look like is not just an ability to do the things that engineers have traditionally done well, well, but to also not only acquire a different set of skills, but a willingness to hear what those skills sound like when they manifest in other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you start to learn that there are a set of academic disciplines that have sometimes hundreds of years <laughs> of credibility with things to offer to engineering and things that engineering has to offer to them. I think thinking about how you would work meaningfully with indigenous people and forms of indigenous knowledge is a very different thing than turning up and saying, I need to build a bridge, can you tell me how to do that? Those are not the same things. Uh, the line that haunts me, however, Lachlan, uh, at the moment, I was in a conversation with the Dean of Architecture at MIT, so the man to whom the Media Lab rolls up. So think of the Media Lab as being one of the places that built the future through most of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Uh, the boss of the Media Lab said to me that he thought that engineers solved problems and designers resolved problems. And I thought that was a fascinating characterization of both of those positions, that the engineering desire to solve a problem 
meant kind of we're just going to solve the problem. And the designer's notion was we need to resolve the problem. And for me, when I think about the work that we've done inside the institute, where I've been very privileged to have Mick as one of our students, and the work we all do in the School of Cybernetics is about getting past that first principle of wanting to solve a problem to thinking about what are the right questions to ask to work out if that is even the problem you should be tackling. And for me, how we get from being able to talk about problem solving to critical question framing and then more to the point critical doing feels like an undoing of a certain sort of education. So the short answer to that question is engineering over the next 30 years is going to need to work out how to accommodate other disciplines and their histories and canonical thinking work out how to move from imagining everything is a problem that needs to be solved to imagining that some things are a situation you might want to resolve and to think a lot more carefully about the kinds of ways we train ourselves. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. Michaela, I might um, throw to you, I mean, in the context of other knowledge systems um, and how we incorporate them best, could you perhaps provide your, um, you know, your thoughts and reflections on how we'll go about that over the next 30 years? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I think um, something that just came to mind while Ani Genevieve was speaking was that language is such an important part of this. And we have over 300 languages, potentially 800 dialects, many of which have been lost um, or are sleeping at the moment. And within those language systems are incredibly deep uh, information sets about uh, the places that we live in country and sky country and sea country and cyber country in the future as well. And I think understanding those languages and not always asking our people to work in English um, would be an amazing advancement for engineering because some of our words, like the word for cabrigal, you might know Cabramatta um, in Sydney, that place is called Cabramatta because it's from the Cabrigal people, my people. And that means the place in the water where the cobra grub are. Now, if I go back to my place and there's no water and there's no cobra grub in there, I have some pretty incredible insights about an environmental condition that needs solving right there. And there's thousands and thousands of pieces of information in languages across Australia and across lots of Indigenous peoples and in fact the world that hold these kind of knowledge sets about what is supposed to be there what are we supposed to be using in those places what should be there and in fact what's also absent so i think being able to be um, multilingual and be willing to work in different language sets would be just an incredible adv advancement for both our people's uh, inclusion in engineering but also engineers understanding of our people and our country thanks and adrian i might sort of turn to you i mean you have a background as an environmental engineer yep. how do you think about you know the fact that we have to bring in more diverse um, voices and knowledge systems um, you know, into a practice where we traditionally haven't incorporated yeah so i'd say um we'll always need engineers to solve problems and not so, but I agree, so we need engineers to solve problems and there'll always be engineers solving problems, but I hope that there'll also be engineers resolving problems before we get to designing the bridge. So I, and I just wanted to give a plug to the ACT government's engineering workforce plan, which I'll put a couple of copies over there. But, but I argued, well, I hope strongly, that engineers are more than just the people that solve the problem once someone else has decided what the problem is, that engineers need to be from the start of the decision-making process to the end. Um, so I think we don't need to train every engineer to either be at that strategic level or the or resolving level or solving it level, but I think we need to give uh, engineers the skill sets where they can choose where they'd like to sit in the decision making process, if you like. So that's one thing. And certainly as you, um, you know, once someone's decided to build the bridge, the engineer's got to design the bridge with the right strength so it doesn't fall down, that, uh, a pretty settled kind of construct. But if we want to be part of the conversation about whether we need the bridge or not, or whether there's a better, better way to solve this problem, then yes, mm. that's where the engineer needs to uh, incorporate a lot more skills um, than just technical uh, to assist with that decision making. So look, I, I was part of the reimagined process. I've had lots of conversations with people about what engineering degree should look like. And I had one with some of my ACT government colleagues just a few weeks ago. And inevitably, all the engineers I work with, tell, t the conversations about marketing and business and accounting and sociology and all these other things, 
But when you look at a four-year course, unfortunately, you've got to pack it with a lot of engineering technical skills. So there's always, I think, for a degree, an ANU and every, any university, how are they going to balance? The hardest question is what you're not going to put in the degree, I think, because you're going to have to have the technical competencies in there, but you want to add in all these other things. Now, I would say communications is probably the core skill that um, someone who wants to be in the resolving or decision-making process needs. So we just need a 10-year engineering degree, basically. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I think that's an interesting point, Jane. I'll turn to you. You know, you mentioned in your introduction, you talked both about the need to understand systems as a whole, but then the trend towards specialisation, which are actually opposite ends of the spectrum. How do you resolve that going forward where we need to, and it talks to Adrian's point as well, that we need specialisation to deal with particular challenges, but at the same time, we want people who can think holistically. Yeah. Look, I'm a passionate advocate for systems thinking, systems analysis, systems design, systems engineering, systems everything. And I think systems can be at the micro level or the macro level. And if you understand the principle of systems, it can help you in just about anything that you do. So yes, we need system of systems designers and yes, we need systems designers and thinkers at the micro level as well. Um, so I think that's how I resolve it. I think uh, once you understand systems principles, they're broadly applicable. And I do think it's one of the most useful skill sets that uh, an engineer or anyone can have. In fact, before I was in this role, I spent the last six years of my life trying to, to teach systems design and systems thinking skills to non-engineers. And it really resonated. It really gave people um, a, a toolkit and a way of thinking that they hadn't been exposed to before. And, and I, I saw people's eyes light up. So. Mm. I do think there's a lot of value there. Yeah, great. Look, it might turn a bit more now to the topic of technology um, specifically, and I think this is obviously going to be a key challenge as we head towards 2050. Obviously, we all think about the really positive benefits that can come um, from technology, but I think we're also starting to appreciate some of the downsides of what happens when um, technology sort of grows unfettered. So Jennifer, I might come back to you. You've obviously spent time in Silicon Valley and there's obviously a lot of intrigue around what's going on in the Valley at the moment, particularly with some of the companies who are becoming very pervasive and so on. Could you maybe reflect on what we should take away from Silicon Valley over the last <laughs> 30 years <laughs> yeah, okay. in thinking about um, engineering in 2050? Mm. Gosh, that's a good question. Uh, so, you know, bearing in mind that I spent my time in Silicon Valley as an anthropologist in a company of engineers, I think it's safe to say I both worked for Intel and Intel was a field site of mine where I conducted a lot of research. Um, I think my takeaways from that and from the other companies I've spent time, and you know, that would be the roll call of all the companies that we worry about today, uh, is a couple of things that are instructive both for the ways they aren't like Australia and some of the things that are probably good as a result of that. Mm. So. One of the most extraordinary things about Silicon Valley is its orientation to innovation, which is that you try something, if it doesn't work, you try something else. Uh, there's no uh, shame or harm in failing. There is, in fact, arguably a culture of it's, you've got to have a couple of failures under your belt before anyone takes you seriously, and how you fail is more important than the failing itself. And there is, as a result of that, a, a remarkably interesting orientation to the future which it is always a place that you go sort of blissfully into with the opportunity of doing something new. One of the really complicated consequences of that, however, is that American technologists, and this is a gross generalization, tend to be remarkably unaware or oblivious or willfully ignorant about where the things they came from came from. They want to imagine that the technical system they built just appeared, like sometime late last week. Um, so you'll have a conversation about AI and then you say to people, actually that started in 1956 at a conference in Dartmouth. They're like, don't be ridiculous, it started in Google in 2013. And you're like, mm, no, no, I can, here's the paperwork <laughs> from an earlier moment. And the problem when you erase history like that is on the one hand it's incredibly liberating, right? You don't have to be held back by the mistakes other people made and the times that things didn't succeed. The challenge with that is that you are unable to learn from what other people have done and also in some ways be both respectful of and incorporative of the knowledge that came before. So for me there's always a really interesting tension in Silicon Valley in its orientation to innovation which is it's always moving forward which is great but it tends to forget that it has a history it might need to attend to. I think one of the things that has been fascinating however in watching all those companies go to scale over the last 40 years is that they have changed the way American universities deliver engineering education and computer science education. 
They've changed the kinds of jobs that engineers might have. And some of those changes aren't new either, right? You know, General Electric, which was the moral equivalent of a big tech company in the 1930s, partnered with MIT to build MIT's first engineering degree because General Electric wanted its executives to be educated in engineering because they too believed that systems thinking was a useful thing for an exec. But what we've seen in the last 15 or 20 years is large tech companies who regard universities as a, basically like a spam filter. So I can think of the head of recruitment at one large tech company who I will not name, who regards Stanford, Caltech and MIT as a useful mechanism for sorting all the possible students that might come out of every high school in America. If you need to bring on 300 to 500 engineers a week, you do not want to go to every high school in America. You want to go to one or two universities you trust who've done the pre-sort for you, and then you're going to take them two years in and retrain them. And so part of the way we haven't done a good job in thinking about engineering, and indeed across the science sector in general, is who is actually our competitive landscape and where is the ecosystem? We imagine that we need to look at other universities as the places that should be doing engineering education. The reality is there are a number of large technology companies of various stripes who imagine that their role is in fact to create their own workforce. And there's a really interesting conflict that is brewing there that is not going to get any less in the next five to ten years where what those organizations are doing is a form of education for engineering and let us remember the notion of certifying engineers is a, a not necessarily global phenomena or a shared one, right? So people are perfectly willing to imagine you might get, you know, two years at a well-known American university, five years in a big tech company and that's enough to set you up for a lifetime. So there are different models that those companies have produced. And of course, they've done all the other things that we know about. They tend to have workforces that look more like you and less like me. Uh, Bold. <laughs> yeah, actually, we've discussed that. And male and white. <laughs> they tend to reproduce you know, particular kinds of ideas and ideals. And there has been not a lot of room to have conversations that suggest we might need other kinds of voices, other kinds of lived experiences, and other kinds of politics in the room. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the other thing I think I would take away from my time in Silicon Valley is that innovation good, the rhetoric of moving fast and breaking things, infinitely more problematic. In fact, it turns out to be exactly just that. They move fast and broke things and now we're fixing them. Mm. Mm. And easier to break things when they're small companies, but not so good when they're big companies and they're breaking democracy, as an example. Well, exactly. <laughs> and I think the, the interesting point here around certification and so on is obviously relevant, Jane, for you um, in your role. I mean, how do we think about, I mean, in Australia, Engineers Australia has a pivotal role in certifying, um, uh, you know, engineering graduates. How do you, th I mean, how does Engineers Australia think about it? How do you think about it in a world where we have big technology companies who want to self-certify, um, you know, engineers? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I don't think our thinking has evolved to have a, having a mature thought on that, um, and I don't think anyone's has really. Um, Engineers Australia works very closely with the international engineering community, um, so they're constantly thinking about what they call their graduate attributes and professional competencies, which are, which many of you may know, sort of set the lay of the land for, for what we expect international standards to be for professional competencies, and then we we kind of map those in the, in the Australian Australian context and so they're evolving but but yeah they're probably evolving too slowly at the moment um, and it's something that we're very aware that we need to pick up the pace of very very aware that um, the pace of change is accelerating and you know it's probably one of the biggest things on our radar at the moment is is making sure that you know we stay relevant it's, it's really important well, you know, let's think back to the early history of certification, right? So in the British tradition, at least, certification wasn't done in universities. It was done by the Society of Civil Engineers and other things like it, which were purpose-built organisations designed to create an abstraction layer that would sit above, you know, Brunel's company and Smeaton's company yeah. and a bunch of other engineers who ran Wardsley, who ran their own companies, who then needed to work out how to have engineers that could be portable between them and so they created a body that would create a certification. And right? we, we actually have another system coming into play in Australia right now with statutory registration in Victoria and New South Wales from the 1st of July this year. Um, it's been in Queensland for, for a long time um, but yeah it's so it's starting to, t to become a more of a widespread phenomenon but registration means something slightly different to chartered, similar but slightly different. So there's, there's numerous different systems in play at the moment and it's all, you know, being merging together with new education models. So it's a really interesting time. So Adrian, you know, thinking about your role and you're sort of looking at engineering across the territory, 
I mean, how would you feel about, you know, the change in certification and getting engineers who are no longer certified through, say, an Engineering Australia framework versus kind of coming out of big tech companies? And so just to be clear here, I'm not suggesting that. Pardon? <laughs> I'm not advocating our position. I'm not saying no, no, no. But it is like, no, no. I think mm. it's right, but it, but I think it is a realistic pathway oh, absolutely. to be thinking about as well the changing nature of how we mm -hmm. educate. Mm -hmm. And while we perhaps haven't seen it as much in Australia with very very large engineering companies, we are seeing it in the US that there's a big power. I wonder. Um, so I yes, um, ACT is committed to an engineering registration scheme. New South Wales and Victoria uh, aren't registering all engineers. A subset of engineers pretty much in the built environment. So digital engineering is not, or IT engineering is not part of that. But I wonder if, um, when we talk about engineering, uh, talking about registration, I can't go, I sort of go back to infrastructure and safety and quality, things you can see, the bridge stands up, if it doesn't stand up, something's gone wrong, you know, check your credentials and do an investigation. Um, is digital though, what you've talked about, is that more about moral questions about what's right or wrong rather than the safety of the tech? Is it a different conversation or the quality of the tech? I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought so. I think yeah. it's really easy to talk about morality and tech as though that was somehow, because that absents us from having to say, actually, if you built a facial recognition system as an engineer and a computer scientist and it didn't recognise black faces or confused black faces, and as a result, decisions were made about policing. I don't think that's a moral question. I think that's a safety question. You are not safe as a black person near that technology. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes a question of actually saying there are extraordinary consequences for data and technical systems that will manifest themselves. And we've talked about them a lot as ethical questions, but they're in fact safety questions. There's questions about responsibility and sustainability. The same way we would say you can't build a bridge that is going to require a set of materials that are extractive and bad for the environment or are going to you know, decay over time in some way, we should be saying the same thing about a technical system. You should not be building a data system that requires an, an energy footprint that is such that sustaining it over time is going to require building a new power station. Or we shouldn't be building a technical system if the consequence of it is that half of the population is disenfranchised. So, you know, and historically we, we deal with a lot of those systems using various kinds of standards, right? It's not just laws and regulations, but ISO standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, the standard that regulates the door you came in with is a safety standard, but it's now becoming a digital one. Yeah. So there's an argument for uh, including a uh, registration scheme being all-encompassing and, and covering... Or at least uh, a different conversation about safety. Mm. I see we're going down quite a dark path. And I, thought <laughs> I, might, uh, I might lighten the mood, and this will be my last question, and then we'll throw to the audience for some Q&A. Um, Michaela, I think you know we've 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 seen, we've seen perhaps the you know the concerns that can come from technology, but the business that you're running and the work that you're doing obviously focuses on one of the really positive uses um, of technology. So I was hoping you could possibly talk a little bit about what you're doing and sort of reflect on yeah the positive that can come from um, from the uptake of technology at scale. Yeah, totally. Um, so what I'm doing at Luna Wani actually is working with 50 kids at Bruni Allen Primary School together with the Palawa traditional owners and the teachers at the school. And we've all come together to co-design an experience where students uh, learn cultural narratives from this place, this country where they're living and going to school and then uh, bringing it to life in augmented and mixed reality. So we take them through a process of learning uh, cultural language, cultural knowledge, going on country, um, and then creating uh, three-dimensional assets together with the elders to help express their understanding of the culture um, from this place. So we do that in a localised context around Australia. Um, it is very positive, but we also get the students and the elders to ask questions. So we spend quite a lot of time on cultural, intellectual property and moral rights um, and licensing. So um, something that we're teaching is this Indigenous knowledge is not for free. We are not putting our elders in a situation where they are asked to work for free. Um, this is a, an opportunity to build an economy around our Indigenous knowledge systems that our elders have fought um, and many have lost their lives to hold this kind of knowledge. So we're trying to place an economic value on that as well as a community and social value um, of the communities they're working with. Um, so in doing that, there are questions about what should and what should not be uh, for this digital world in the context of cultural knowledge. And an example that we're faced with right now in the Darug community is 
um, around deep nostalgia and deep fakes. What, what are our protocols, what are our laws that we are going to build in cyber country around these kind of technologies? Because we have cultural protocols and laws that say we actually don't want to evoke our ancestors in three-dimensional augmented reality using deep fake technology. Uh, once people have passed over, they should be at peace um, for our people. So these, these conversations require time and that's something that we talk to communities about as well through the program is we can't expect um, elders in the community in particular to be all the technologies that are coming away in the community and that we need to have respectful discussions on country and the time that it takes to resolve these really big questions for our community. You know, thanks, Michaela. I think, you know, sort of reflecting on your comments and also of the panel, I think, you know, perhaps the thing that's really is important as we move forward is actually being able to ask these these deep questions and having the forum where we can actually sort of, you know, transparently discuss and prosecute, um, you know, how we think about these things, um, particularly yeah. as we move towards engineering in 2050. I do have a provocation around this, just as you were all talking. Um, unfortunately, I dropped out, so I'm not sure if it was discussed or not. But um, where do we sit when our people have a cultural practice that might have been being practiced for tens of thousands of years, where it involves structural engineering, for example? Where does the acknowledgement of our understanding of engineering sit in this regulatory and educative framework? Because is anyone prepared to say to our old people that we actually don't understand safety or we don't understand structural engineering? We have been able to practice our culture over eons that proves that we actually have a great and deep understanding of these things. Look, I think that I think that's a it's a fundamentally important question, and I'm I suspect I'm going to answer it by saying, you know, referring back to some of Chris's comments earlier. I think it comes from actually creating space for those conversations to be had, and I think within the school, in particular, creating um, this new you know indigenous design hub and actually having the space for those conversations is going to be the way that we're actually going to be able to deal with that best. Well, and to Michaela's point, though, also litigating your language not Michaela's, litigating the notion of what it would mean to say Indigenous engineering is in fact a skilled profession and that it builds on tens of thousands of years of practice. I mean, Mick and I have talked about mm. the Bawarana fish traps over and over again, right? But, you know, there is a technical system of millennia in the making and the keeping and one that, you know, does work that actually would be quite hard to build today. And there's something about saying, not just declaring it to be an in intangible cultural asset, which the state has done, but also in fact starting to say there are forms of engineering knowledge there that ought to be part and parcel of the canon, right? When you read the happy little book about things invented in Australia, we don't start with those or end with those because the temptation often when we talk about Indigenous engineering, and Mick and I have talked about this too, is that we describe it as a past thing. It's like we're building on it because it's historic as opposed mm. to saying it is contemporary and present and riven through everything. And uh, sitting with the discomfort of that's interesting. Yeah, and thinking how we use that discomfort as we start mm -hmm. to think about the future um, of how we plan engineering education. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. to your point, you know, I, you know, I'm a middle class white guy and actually coming to the recognition that we hold a knowledge system that we have, but that that's only one of many and that we need to actually create space for diverse and inclusive voices to be part of whatever we want engineering to be in the future. Well, and you did that when you did an acknowledgement of country that says we have not just a responsibility to acknowledge where we are, but to acknowledge what that makes us both responsible for and privileged to get to continue, which is an engineering base that is tens of thousands of years old. Absolutely. I'd like now to just to throw to throw over to the audience to give you some time to um, to ask questions of the panel. I notice that we're we're coming up on seven o'clock, and so I don't want to keep people um, late, but I would like to give you the chance to ask questions if you have any. We have a microphone that'll be roving around, so if you just if you have any questions, if you just pop your hand up, and we'll get a mic to you. Hi, I've got a question. Um, as you're probably aware, uh, the New South Wales government has got a building commissioner. Who are you? Oh, oh sorry, my name's Matt. I've got a Master of uh, Project Management. Um, as you know, or probably aware, New South Wales government um, has got a building commissioner, especially after the Opal and Mascot Tower fiascos. 
Um, and the building commissioner can actually, if the building is not crash hot, to say the least, uh, can withhold the occupancy certificate, which means that nobody can move in to any of the apartments. Now, as far as I'm aware, the ACT government does not have a building commissioner as yet. Um, do you think that this is a good idea, especially with the number of um, units being developed in, say, Belconnen, Woden and so on, and you, the idea is to reduce the potential of any future problems by having something already in place saying, whoops, there's a building commissioner in the ACT as well. So therefore, maybe we might have to reconsider how we build this uh, particular block of apartments um, rather than, well, there's none, so let's go for it and uh, hope for the best. There is a constructions registrar, probably uh, fulfills some of the role of the building commissioner, but I'm not across all of the role of the building commissioner. But if we just confine ourselves to engineering, um, you know, many different uh, professions are involved in the development of an apartment block or any other type of infrastructure, but engineers are part of that. And from my understanding, there are examples where engineers haven't covered themselves in glory and haven't done a to the job we might have expected of a professional. Um, and I've come late to that conclusion, always willing to blame someone else, but unfortunately I think there are examples where the engineering has been up to scratch. And on that basis, I'm very much a supporter of an engineering registration scheme that gives us the ability to stop an engineer practicing. So as I understand it really at the moment, um, there's no quality control around who signs off on a structural engineering drawing. I could sign off on it and that would be pretty scary and I won't and I shouldn't. Um, but you as a consumer probably have an expectation when you go to the doctor, indeed you are talking to a doctor, and when you get your structural engineering uh, report signed, that is indeed signed by a qualified structural engineer. So that's one thing about registration which I like, it, 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 it sort of strengthens. I don't think there's many non-structural engineers signing structural drawings by the way, but at least let's get it in writing. You can't do it, you're breaking the law. Uh, and then on the other side, if something does go wrong, at the moment, that redress is through the courts or the building commissioner or something else. But I don't think out of that process is an ability to stop someone practicing. You might go to court, you might lose all your money, you might be found liable, whatever it is, but you can wake up tomorrow and still sign structural engineering drawings. Perhaps you shouldn't be able to. And that's where I hope registration yep. can be a clear message to the sector that um, do your best every time. Uh, otherwise, you might find out you can't practice your profession. And for those of you who don't know, the New South Wales registration scheme that's coming in on the 1st of July this year is solely focused on class two apartment buildings. So you will need to be a registered engineer uh, to, to work on class two apartment buildings. Um, hello everybody, uh, Dr. Catherine Ball. I'm an associate professor in the practice of engineering here at Kex. We're probably one of the newest members of staff that was onboarded from Brisbane during the lockdown. So there's a bit of software tech that's actually helped. And we've also got um, Antonia was obviously in the UK at the moment onboarding. Um, so it's been an interesting thing to see the last year uh, from an industry perspective. Um, and so I'd really like just a snapshot maybe of ideas from the panel of something that I've experienced and I found quite useful as to, okay, we have 2050 to look forward to, but we have to start making some change now. We know that things are going to be more deep dive, uh, but transdisciplinary. So how do you become more siloed yet more connected? It's almost like an oxymoron that has to happen. One of the things that I found quite useful is this idea of global challenges. And so I was a judge on the Ocean Discovery X Prize where we literally said, this is the problem, solve it. And we went out to the whole world on all levels that could possibly come up with an answer to that and on the ocean cleanup x prize they had a short list of 40 people that could all clear up oil spills in different ways and they all passed the bar one of them was a tattoo artist from las vegas and so you sort of have to ask yourself what on earth would a tattoo artist be able to contribute to oil spill technology this person doesn't work in the ocean has not got an engineering degree that person works with oil and water every day and understands how it behaves. So Mother Nature for me is the best systems engineer and I'm an environmental engineer by training like Adrian is and biased in all of those respects. Mm -hmm. Geography for me was where I first fell in love with systems engineering. So geography as a 15 year old was, was where I really fell into it. So as we sit and look at 
engineering actually as humans what we do is engineering and how we value some of the things that aren't classed as engineering what examples have you seen like i've had with the x prize where you produce a challenge a goal a nexus within which government industry and academia can come together to advance us in an accelerated and new and exciting way whilst taking advantage of all of those deep layers of human knowledge across the world from anyone anywhere including tattoo artists in vegas Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll bite, Kath. Hi. <laughs> um, so I got a digital token on Saturday night from the Royal Shakespeare Company in London. And the Royal Shakespeare Company in London has spent the last year trying to work out how do you have a theatre company when you can't have a theatre? How do you have a theatre company when you can't have a play or an audience? How do you have the play be the thing when you can't have people communing with each other in experiencing it, right? And so they spent the last year working out how to bridge uh, content capture, content sharing, virtual and augmented reality, creating spaces in which people can be together experiencing virtual reality, even though they are not physically together, distributed across the globe, having the people who are participating build the thing in real time and using all of it to celebrate the 400th anniversary of A Midsummer Night's Dream because what they had planned to do in July was take a house in Stratford-on-Avon and turn it into an accumulation of everyone's experience of that play and over a space of a month have people come into that place and leave things in it so that you could go to that place and experience the play unfolding around you. The challenge, of course, became you couldn't go to Stratford. <laughs> you couldn't really do much of anything else. And so over the last year, they have worked across multiple disciplines, across multiple countries, across multiple kinds of problems. So these are engineering problems, these are computer science problems, these are world data flow and internet problems, these are how you give everyone a unique authentic identifier to participate in the challenge. And for me what was extraordinary about it was no one said this is an engineering problem. No one started by saying this is an engineering challenge. Of course it rapidly became an engineering computer science challenge. What it started with was a how do you create a moment of magic how do you create a moment where the play could be the thing when it couldn't be in any of the ways we knew? And for me, what was really interesting about that was not starting with a government, not starting with a company in some ways, and not starting with an engineering problem, but starting with a profoundly human desire and building out from there. That's an extraordinary thing. Adrian, Jane, I'll, Kayla. I'll take the opportunity to end on a positive note. Um, I, I am excited by the next 20 years in terms of knowledge um, creation and using that knowledge to make better decisions and better solutions. And I'll frame that the environmental point of view as well as ecology as a system. Uh, I hope that over the next 20, 30 years, we'll learn more about how that system operates so that when we're interacting with it, we'll be able to make better decisions to get better outcomes. So uh, I think I, I will say get a lot of engineers together. We just can't we congregate on the negatives. We can't help it. <laughs> know what it is if it's a professional thing um, but certainly 99% uh, of what we do is very positive and we always we're always I think very self-reflective about what we need to do better but as a profession the values we're, the value we provide community I think is way I'll say way more than any other profession because the, our, our, our well-being and, and quality of life is fundamentally founded I'll say on the infrastructure and the technology that we enjoy every day and we take it for granted that it works pretty much 90 all the time, but we couldn't live without it. So um, totally think that we are part of the uh, solution and what we will do over the next 20 years will make our quality of life and wellbeing more and more. And that's probably a good point to start thinking about um, wrapping up, but I think um, we've touched on so many interesting topics tonight and I would love to kind of keep the conversation going. Maybe to wrap up, if we'll just sort of whip around the panel if you've got sort of um, your last sort of 30 second comment and Mick we might start with you. Sorry I'm just juggling some computer engineering problems here <laughs> in Bruny <Brunei> Island. <laughs> um, yeah I just really respectfully would like to thank everyone for listening this afternoon and hope that it, it sparks a desire from you to reach out to our mobs and to work collectively with our mobs and to step a little bit into our world and understand our world of engineering. And I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for everyone to work together for 2050, because I really believe that if we don't do it, 
we may not even get there. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michaela. Jane? Yeah, look, I might just draw on a, um, my concluding remark, uh, draw from a comment you made, Catherine, and that's how do I reconcile the necessary deep dives into complexity with the need to work on cross-disciplinary challenges? And I think the answer is that yes, some of us will have to have the depth of expertise in whatever complex area we choose to specialise in, but that everyone is going to need to be able to collaborate and work in cross-disciplinary teams, no matter what technical language you talk. So I think that's really important. In my experience, and this draws on, a, on something Genevieve said earlier, to me it's about being able to ask the right questions. And we can generalise the questions that we ask as engineers and actually apply them to broader problems. Um, and I could talk about that for hours, but I've, I've seen it work and I think it's something that we can do. So if we can learn to ask the right questions, um, I, think, um, I think that is a step in the right direction in terms of being able to work in cross-disciplinary teams and collaborating. Adrian, did you want to make another 30 second comment? I think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Genevieve, last words yours. Oh, always good. <laughs> <laughs> so the gift from the world for me this year, so the 30th anniversary of the first school of engineering at the ANU also gets to be the first weeks of starting a new school of cybernetics here at the ANU. It's probably the first school of cybernetics, uh, well, I know it's the first school of cybernetics in Australia, uh, it's one of the first schools of cybernetics in the Southern Hemisphere in quite some time. I'm willing to bet money, and I'd love to be proven wrong, but it's probably the first school of cybernetics that's ever been headed by a woman. Uh, and for me, the thing that connects it to engineering is that cybernetics, it's an old, an old concept in some ways. It comes from the 1940s and 1950s. But it was a theory of how you might imagine the system, and a system that would always have to include the technical, the human, and the ecological. And when I look at the challenges we have over the next 30 years, the promise of cybernetics of a way of analysing systems that were always and already human and technical and ecological feels like an incredibly powerful tool that might just have been a little bit early in 1948, but in 2021 feels like a really good place to be sitting. So. Can I just butt in? I'm not sure if you're aware, I don't know if you've heard, but the EU is building a digital twin of the planet. And um, it's going to take more computing power than we actually have currently available. But that's that's what they've started building. It's quite exciting. Am I in it? Probably. How would you feel if you were? I'm going to bring us to a close because this is the start of the next of two hours of conversation. Um, please join me with thanking our panelists tonight here. Um, <laughs>